Um, we're very happy to have Michael Lotaka <laughs> talk to us about invariant measures for oil. So thank you. Also. Thank you very much, Theodore, for the invitation. I'm really happy to be there today, and uh, it's, been, it's, it's a really nice day here. So, well, hi. Uh, well, so I'm going to try to, ex to motivate first a question that I'm interested in, and I'm going to show you uh, a few, I mean, one takeaway of this talk, I expect, is that you know about the Bourguin's invariant uh, measure argument that is used to globalize solution. And I will show you how we can combine that with another argument of Cookson to study some kind of long-term uh, growth problem for the LA equation. So let me just first start by writing the LA equation down. So we work in two dimensions. Uh, and so the pressure field is just, well, we are in the torus. So it's just a scalar field, and U is two-dimensional, so it's a vector field. And we have divergence-free condition, and uh, well, and, and some initial data in some Sobolev space, HS. Well, and here in this talk, we are mainly concerned with regular solution. So S is large. So for us, it would be like here. You see that. For S larger than two, then we already know that we can construct uh, local solutions, uh, global solutions even for that. Uh, and because we are in two dimensions, so I think that you're aware that we can just take the vorticity formulation, which is uh, uh, very nice for us. So the varsity, vorticity, I just take like capital omega as the curl of U. And it satisfies some transport equation. Well, right, so that's a very, uh, uh, very nice formulation like that. And the question that I want to study is the possible growth for the, the, the high Sobolev norm of this. So it all goes back, I think, to the beginning of uh, last century. I think it was Volibner and uh, who, who proved existence of smooth solution. And by an argument of Judovich, you can also find like very precisely what's the upper bound for the growth of the solar wave storm. So let me, let me recall that. Uh, so you take S larger than two, uh, then the statement is that you have global well positiveness for these equations. Uh, well, you tr when you want to find continuous uh, solution with values in subway space HS. And moreover, you have this bound. I will comment on that a lot. So the constant here may depend on the initial data, and you have this double exponential bound, which looks like a very terrible upper bound. Well, OK, so here I'm stating this in the torus, but you have the same thing in the whole space, and every bounded domain, you have this upper bound. Uh, well, you also have the same thing for the vorticity, of course. Well, so uh, let me. First, let me show you well, where the double exponential comes from and why maybe there is a hope that, well, we are not doing like the most accurate estimate and maybe there is a way in some sense to, to do something better. So the, the, the proof, so in order to prove, uh, to, to prove something like that, because we're in two dimension, I, I will just try to prove estimate an HS norm of this thing. So what you do is, well, you just want to look at the evolution of this thing, say, well, when, when you take the derivative, then uh, what you have is that you will have to take uh, the scalar product in HS between uh, omega and its derivative. So it will be like a minus u then gradient omega. 
And I will just rewrite it like for I'm just putting the relative inside to write this as a, as a scalar product in L2. So here, just, just a formal argument. Uh, well, so I would just forget about the minus. And here I have like gradient, uh, I mean, S derivatives. You can just think of S as an integer. And here, well, when I uh, take S derivative of this, so the first term will be, uh, I mean, the higher order term is when all the derivatives fall on omega. So I have this term. And then there is the next order term, which is when you only have like S minus one derivatives that go there. And so you have, you see this gradient of U appearing here. here. So you have something like this. And here, well, here there's a major feature of the equation is that uh, like u uh, dot gradient of this thing is orthogonal to, to it. Like, so this is a major feature of the equation is that this vanishes. And otherwise, we will not be able to close any estimates on the HS norm. And this one looks like now the main uh, term. So what you what, what you first want to do is to bound it, like do a crude bound, putting that in L infinity. And so you have this. And then, well, this will just be, uh, well, I'm, I'm writing, yeah. So that's omega squared in HS. And so you see that, well, if this is bounded, then you have uh, just a simple differential equation, and when you integrate it, you have exponential bound, not double exponential. So actually, the double exponential comes from the fact that, well, you have to estimate this gradient of u in L infinity. And of course, there is a problem there. And the problem is that, well, like, you know that the rotational of u is omega. So when you want to find, uh, like, gradient of u, well, gradient of u is like just some gradient of the inverse of the rotational that you can inverse because you have the inverse free condition of omega. So this is something of order zero. So it's a calderon zygmunt operator. And so you can prove, uh, estimates. Actually, what you can prove is that the gradient of u in LP is bounded by, well, the calderon zygmunt constant here will be p time uh, omega in LP. Uh, this is at time t. And now, because we have a tr uh, the equation on omega is a transport equation, then you know that these are conserved. And so you have just about by p time the initial data in LP. But this is only valid when p uh, is strictly between 1 and infinity. So you cannot hope for an estimated at infinity. So what you do instead is like, well, you can still do like refined estimates by just like forcing this term to be in LP. So if you put this term in LP, well, then here, well, you have to pay a price, which is that it will slightly worsen this inequality here. And by the end of the day, the, the equation that you get is this one, is that you get that, uh, so if you call this Uh, um, in HS, then you have just some very simple equation like this. Well, something that looks like this. You optimize in P, and when you optimize in P, this brings you an extra log factor here. And this is a very simple differential equation that when you integrate this, you find a double exponential bound. So my main concern here is, well, is it, well, you see that here it's, we fail short by just a little bit. So, well, is there a way that, I mean, uh, first, is it true that you can construct solutions that exhibit this double exponential growth? And the answer is yes, in some condition, I, I will show you. And more generally, like, what is the generic behavior that we can expect? So, let me draw you just one picture so this is a theorem by Kislev and Verac. So examples are double exponential growth.
So it's a paper by Kislev and Verak, and the version on the torus is due to Schlatos. So what they prove is that there exists some initial vorticity in some smooth, I mean, they even construct like something like C infinity, I guess, uh, such that, well, you have exactly the double exponential growth Well, and this is on the case where the, instead of looking at the torus, you look at it on the disk. And this is just exponential uh, when you are on the torus. Okay, so on the torus, it's Schlatos, and based on the ideas of Kislev and Zverak on the disk. And it's a very specific scenario, like, okay, so, well, it, uh, apparently, this seems to answer partially the, 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 the question because on the torus, it's still open to prove that, well, to construct a double exponential growth scenario or to disprove it. Like maybe, maybe actually, maybe all solutions don't grow faster than exponential. Uh, actually, I don't know, but. So, well, just, just to draw the picture, what you do is you take an initial vorticity like this, so you take like minus one here and plus one here, so you see that here it will move like this. So this will push all the fluid particles there, and here it will push all the fluid particles there. Uh, and so you said that there will be a concentration phenomena, and you are like, you are able to track it very precisely because this, uh, like this, this, uh, uh, this, this vorticity is explicit and you can like, uh, well, of course, the equation is non-linear, so you need to, to look at it precisely, but you can track this phenomenon. And, well, so this is uh, how they get double exponential growth. But these scenarios just fail like that on the torus, and you can just like try to follow this scenario on the torus, but you have to smooth things out and you lose the double exponential growth in finite time. So you only can keep track of the exponential growth. So the main questions here is, for me, are the following. Well, is it possible to get double exponential growth on the torus or, or maybe, maybe not? So like what happens generically? And this is what I want to, uh, to, to explain to you today. It's like, well, uh, why when we kind of have like random initial data, or like generic initial data, whatever it means, because we have to give a precise meaning to this, why can we expect maybe some, uh, maybe a better behavior, right? So I'm, I will just take the results and I'll show you how we get to there and so just, let me write uh, the result that, that I want to prove today. So I hope that this gives, this gives you enough motivation, but of course you feel free to ask a question. In the death case, you, you prove that by reducing it to this bad equation, or there is an intuitive reason why it's uh, Oh, you, uh, what do you mean by bad case? No, like, oh, here, how do you? Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you, you find this scenario here, uh, and uh, well, so here, the scenario you see that it's discontinuous, like because it's like minus one here, plus one here. So you have to smooth it a little bit here, so that it'll, it, you smooth it a little bit here, so that it gives you. Uh, a smooth scenario that is exploding, but it's a very precise scenario. It's like I think it's the only one we know that is uh, known to give double exponential growth. So, in my opinion, like maybe on like maybe on the disk, it's also very specific in a sense that uh, generically I don't know what happens. Maybe it's better than that. So, so yeah, that's like a hyperbolic point, right? Which would give exponential normally, but because the, it's nonlinear, it's reinforcing. So the eigenvalue of the hyperbolic point actually grows. And that's why you get the double exponential growth. It's like a really steepening hyperbolic point. 
And, and what happens in the torus, I did not draw that, but in the torus, so you try to play the same game. Uh, and this time, the problem is that you have to smooth things along this axis, just as there, but also along this axis, which is not the boundary anymore. And because you smooth things a little bit, you lose this hyperbolic scenario. And so you, if you wait long enough, then you lose the double exponential. So, so it looks like very specific. Uh, so on, on, at least on the torus, we don't know about double exponential growth scenario. And also, if you think of like anything generic, then we just fail to obtain the, the, the exponential bound in the first place because of some continuity problem of the Carter and Zingmuller operators in L infinity. But like, what happens for generic data, like uh, the bounds? Uh, so yeah, that would be something. But then you will also need to propagate some kind of nice randomness at time t. So that's that's another problem. Uh, okay, so what, what I want to show you is the results uh, I obtained. Uh, these are partial results, but I'm going to comment on, on that. So uh, what, what I do is that, uh, and what we are going to do is to construct, so you take first, take S that is large. I think that in this talk, I will just try to show you the computation for S equal three. Then what I claim is that there exists uh, a measure that I call mu s, and it's a measure on uh, hs. So it's really like it's a probability measure on, on, on hs, so it really gives us meaning of what we call like generic. I mean, generic for this measure, of course, because it's infinite dimensional, you can think of many kind of measures that will tell you different kind of results. So we construct this measure, and so we have the following property. So the measure is really linked to, to the earlier equation in the sense that it's uh, an invariant measure. I will explain that thing later. For 2D Euler, so it's not any measure. It's really linked to the dynamics of the Euler equation. The second property, and it's a very important one, is that this uh, this measure is not trivial. For example, like, it's not the direct mass at zero. The direct mass at zero is an invariant measure. But it's, of course, it's not interesting. So here, it's not the direct mass, but like, we can exclude any atom. So the measure of any function w is zero. When you take like for any function, uh, well, uh, any function that you give me, it does not charge this one. Uh, another property is that, uh, well, we can charge arbitrarily large norms. So, so, well, if you look at this set, then this has positive measure for all R. Well, of course, that depends on R, but that means just that you have arbitrarily large uh, norm in this uh, set. And uh, the last property, which is the I mean, was the goal of all of this is that we can track the growth of the solutions on the support of this measure. So the statement is for mu s almost every uh, initial data, well, the global solution that is associated to this equation, because well, we already know that we can construct global solutions. Well, we have a growth of, uh, well, it's t, well, like one plus t, say, to some power alpha. So it's a polynomial bound. It's not double exponential or just exponential. It's a very slow bound compared to the double exponential. And alpha is just some number that depend on uh, on the parameter here, so like on S and uh, yeah, and well, just some number depending on S. So is it the alpha you would expect from shearing, or is it fast? Oh, uh, well, what is the alpha you get from shearing? It's so you just pay S. So like one derivative cos t, n derivatives cos t p n. I think. I get something like, 
thing, I guess something close to S minus one or something like that, or okay. yeah, it depends, like there is a whole numerology there, but uh, it, what, what we can do is actually, well, here I stated the, the growth for the HS norm because we construct uh, the solution in HS, but you can also like look at the H sigma norm for sigma less than S, and you get better bounds for this one. So, well, if you give me some norm, I can cook some measure, and for this measure, the growth will be like uh, some kind of arbitrary close to a linear growth. Like, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, well, I don't know how many measures I can make, but it's what, what I can do is that for any S, I can cook some measure mu S with prescribed average uh, HS norm. Like the, the HS norm to the square, the, uh, this average, I can prescribe it. So uh, yes, I can do a lot of them. And, be, and I'm using this to uh, prove this property because I can just add all of them with all weights that's assumed to one and uh, prove this property. So actually, this property is not the main uh, one in the proof. Wouldn't it be nice to not have three? Uh, to have an invariant measure of the back part? Uh, yes, we, we, when nice. we, can, we can do it. In the sense that, I mean, you know, not, not necessarily in the compact, but just like, uh, just with prescribed, uh, I mean, no, right? no, 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 no. That, that would not be in the compact because we cannot exclude that. I mean, just on average, we can prescribe the, the average of the HS norm, but of course we can have like, on very small probability sets, very large uh, norms. Yeah, no, I don't know how to, 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 to do that. But this would be interesting. Uh, Sorry? Uh, for the ergodicity properties, I actually, I, I don't know. I did not study ergodic properties of that. The problem is that first, we don't have, an, I mean, we are far from a uh, unique invariant measure, for example. But if we had like unique, I mean, construct in some setting, a unique invariant measure like that, then we will have like much more insights. Especially, I think that if we have an, because you see that, that the, the, the next goal, I mean, one of the next goal here is to describe the support of the measures. So here I, I told you like, well, okay, we can exclude the atoms, any, that there's no atom. But one major threat to this, to this is that, well, maybe, so you know that there are a lot of uh, stationary solution for Euler. And it's not clear that we have other solutions in this support. Like uh, maybe these measures are supported on stationary solution. But this will also be, I mean, I would be fine with that. In this, of course, like this completely voids the last statement. That was my starting point. But it would be like constructing like an invariant measure on, I mean, uh, it would, would mean that with the scheme I'm going to show you, you only select uh, solutions that are stationary. Because I'm going to show you how we construct this solution. It's like we regularize things, we construct invariant measures, and then we shrink some viscosity to zero. And, uh, yeah. and, and the measures along that approximate sequence are ergodic for essentially every step plus force. So, uh, so what I think it's an interesting point, like the way you construct them is you add viscosity, you add a random force, then it's uniquely ergodic. You have a sequence of well-defined measures which really describe the long-term behavior. Yeah. And those have limits that may or may not be ergodic for, or probably not in general, because it's too rich for them. And it's just uh, when you take the limit, of course, like you lose, uh, I mean, I lose all the knowledge I have on the measures. Uh, but, uh, well, it's, let me show you the, the starting point of that is that actually, so here the, there is the problem of construction of the invariant measures. Uh, but first, let me show you like if we have these three points, then it's actually uh, easy to get this. Actually, easy, but I mean, it's, it's an argument by Bourguin, which is, I mean, it's a really, really nice argument that I want to, to show you. So this is what I like to call some meta theorem because it's not rigorous. 
but you understand from that that we can uh, really, uh, I mean, we can use it in many situations. So it's, it's due to Bourguin, and so we are making some assumption in some, like take some PD, take some PD, uh, DTU is some function f of u, uh, and some initial data that are in some space, uh, well, here I will use like sub spaces, hs. And so you formally assume that you have solutions to that. Well, in our case, it's not the problem. We have global solutions. So let's just write formally the flow. That, so u at time t, I'm just writing it like with the flow notation that it's phi t u0. So you push u0 until time t. And I'm making three assumptions, three very uh, uh, important well, said. Say that you have a measure on the space HS, like so it's a probability measure on HS. And you have two properties of this measure. So, well, so first first property is that it's invariant. Well, I guess that's a very strong statement, that it's invariant, so it means that uh, Here, it just means that, well, the probability for this measure, uh, mu s, uh, so the probability on the u naught such that at time t, you belong to some set A, which is like included in the HS, this is the same than at time zero. Right? So here, it's, you can say something at time t only given something at time, at time zero. And, well, other property that I'm assuming is that, well, we know this measure, so originally Bourguin was doing that with a Gaussian measure, so I'm just going to show you because it's, it's very impressive. So it means that you ask for tail estimates, like, well, what's the probability that your data are in your space HS are larger than lambda? Well, in Bourguin, he's saying like, well, because he had Gaussian measures, then he had Gaussian tails. And in our case, it will not be that. Uh, I'm just going to show you how we can change that. And the third property that we assume is the property about the, the local uh, well positiveness of the equation. So we assume that we have a standard local positiveness theory, which is that, well, if you have an initial data of size lambda, then, well, there exists some time tau, which is some inverse power of lambda, and which is such that, well, you have like, you can construct locally the solutions, you attempt, uh, and you don't double the size until you uh, get out of an interval of size tau. Okay, so that's, that's the usual uh, local positiveness theory, which we have access to in our case. And the claim now, and it's a very strong claim, is that for, all, for almost every initial data, uh, uh, what you can have is that, what we can prove is that you have global solutions. Well, you would tell me, yes, but I assume I have a flow. Well, but actually, the argument is the former argument, which will actually construct the global solution afterwards. So you really just need the local theory and these other statements. That the measure is just formally uh, uh, invariant, just like some computation that tells you it should be invariant and it will be. And so almost surely you have global existence and you have a very, uh, a very slow bound for the growth. It's a square root of log, not even a log square root of log. So it's a very slow band. Of course, the square root of log is linked to the exponential of lambda squared. But you see that this is not the kind of statement that we usually, uh, usually obtain. If you were well, first, if you iterate the local world positiveness, then you're not sure you're going to have global solution. Uh, well, if you, don't have, if you don't have any conserved quantity, then, well, maybe people will be able to prove like exist global existence with exponential bounds, or maybe sometimes 
polynomial, polynomial bounds, but this is very, very strong. So I think I only have half an hour left. But, so I, let me show you the proof of this because it's actually very short and it re really relies on this picture. So, well, so instead of constructing global solution, let me construct solution until time capital T. So just to construct solution until capital, uh, time capital T, and let me track the size of the data. Uh, and I will take just some, some size lambda and two lambda, because this will be useful for the local theory. And well, so what I can do is that I, I start from some initial data with size less than lambda, and well, I will do something like this, like until time tau, maybe I don't double the size, something like that. But I will land somewhere here. And so here I can just chop my interval uh, with intervals of size tau. And now I'm going to do something very specific, which is that instead of looking at these solutions, because here I cannot control these solutions anymore, I will just look at very specific solution that actually go back below lambda at each time and tau. So the solution, when you draw their norms, it would really look like this. So it's very, these are very specific kind of solutions. And I want to show you that there are a lot of them for the measure. So what is this set of good initial data? So that I will call this G lambda T. That's the set of the, all the U0 such that, uh, well, well, that's, well, what you want is that for all n, well, here it's just like t over tau, it's the number of uh, intervals, and you just want that at time n tau, uh, well, your, your, your size is just less than lambda. Right. So that's exactly like if you give me a solution like this, the local theory is constructing you the solutions until time t. And now, well, I want to estimate, I want to prove that this has very large uh, probability. So I would just, well, just look at uh, the complement. So the complement is included in like in the union of the complement of this. So I can bound the probability of this by just the sum of uh, the sum of the measure of the, the complement of this. So that's actually the probability of being larger than lambda, right? And now I'm just going to use everything I know is that uh, here, because I have invariance of the measure, so I can say something at time t, that at time n tau, which is the same thing at time uh, zero. And now I use the other property that this is bounded by just some uh, exponential of minus lambda square. And how many uh, intervals I have is t over tau, and tau is just an inverse power of lambda. So it's a lot of intervals, but polynomial a lot. So in the end, I have something like t, lambda to the power k and exponential of minus c lambda square. And so you see that if I want to make this small, so say that, give me an epsilon, then I want to make this smaller than epsilon, then I just need to take something like uh, lambda is the square root of log of t over epsilon. Well, if you plug that here, you see that the number of the interval does not play any role here, it's just like the exponential is killing everything. And so that's, that's the core of the, of the argument. Uh, well, this argument is actually very flexible because I'm not really using invariance of the measure. I'm just using that I know something at time t given something at time zero. So maybe I have just some inequality, this will be enough. The other flexible part is that I don't need at all these kind of things. And in our case, in our case, the measure that I will construct will satisfy a much weaker bound. The weaker bound that they will satisfy will be that, well, I will have like, I will have this kind of bound. Well, I mean like, maybe like, 
that the expected value of the HS norm to the squared is some constant, well, it's bounded at least. So it, here, if you use Markov inequality, then, well, you don't get this, but you get one over lambda squared. Well, that's not very, that's not that small. And because we are dealing with the Euler equation, then the local well poisonous time will just be one over lambda. So you see that if you plug everything here, then here we just have lambda, and here we just have one over lambda squared. So the argument still works. You will just need to take something like, uh, so in the end, what you obtain here is just t over lambda, which you can still make small if you take lambda of the size of uh, t, something like that. So you see that you construct solution, uh, which will have a growth here until capital time t, bounded by some power of t. Well, so, well, here is just to show you that this argument is flexible, and now we just need, I mean, we just, that's uh, not an easy task, but we need to construct this invariant measure in uh, the high regularity solver spaces. But actually, the construction of invariant measures, usually the one I've learned, uh, were always on very low regularity space. It's always given by some statistical physics uh, principle that construct like you give Gibbs measure that lives at very low regularity spaces. So it was very useful for Broguin in this context because he was trying to solve the equation at very low regularity. But in our context, we need to find a construction of invariant measure at very high regularity. And the only construction I know is the one of Cookson. So I'm just going now to show you how we construct this, uh, these measures. And if you put that together, this gives you the proof of the theorem I, I, I claimed. So, So we'll use uh, an argument of Cookson, and well, actually, Cookson constructed invariant measures for the Euler equation in, uh, in the paper something like 20 years ago, I guess, uh, in H2. But in our case, we need to, to have like more than H2 regularity because we want to have access to the local regular, uh, the, the good local positiveness theory. So to be like in HS for H strictly larger than two. So I'm just going to do like S equal three. And uh, it's a very small modification of his argument is that, well, his argument is that you take the equation that you want to, uh, for which you want to construct invariant measures. So here, just write the earlier equation. Well, I, I will write it in a different form here. I'll just like this form, I will just call it B of U. And because I'm, well, I want to get rid of the pressure. So I just apply the Lorel projector and I forget about the pressure. Uh, so U now, it just leaves in L2 uh, with divergence free. And, well, well, and let me get, well, and so what he is doing is that it's, he will construct these measures by compactness arguments. So I'm just going to, re to, to regularize this equation by just adding here, so I just use a, like a hyper dissipative uh, kind of Navier-Stokes equation. So I just put uh, this. And on the right hand side, I will, uh, it will be a stochastic equation because it will be really, uh, really helpful to construct the invariant measure. So, so here I need to put the square root of nu. You will see why it's the square root of nu because, uh, because of the Ito formula. And here I have some stochastic uh, forcing term. And what is this term? Well, actually, it's a, it's a noise that is regular in, in space. So here, phi n are just some numbers that we are going to choose. Um, here, you put like derivatives of uh, Brownian motion. So it's like it's a white noise in time, but regular in space. And uh, well, and here you have like e n of x that is just like. The en of x are just like the combination of the, expo of the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on the torus, like these are exponentials. But we need to make them divergence free so that it's the basis of L2D, well, just Hilbert basis, right? Um, okay, so here it's very standard here to construct 
uh, invariant measures for this. So I, I'm, not, I'm not going to review that. We can just take that uh, as, as a black box because our main problem will be to, 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 to take the limit, of course. Finite or oh, here it's really a combination on all the frequencies. But you don't really, do you really need that? I, mean, mm, I think I don't need that. I think I don't. What about like the higher matting with here? Uh, like the, you, you don't need to, I mean. Oh, uh, oh no, 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 no. At some points, well, because when you want to study the measures in the end, when you want to prove that there is no atom at some points, uh, I think I need that all the phi n were non-zero in the end. So there is some kind of tuning of the all the phi n in the end. So I need to take like them non-zero. But, but for the first part, like constructing some measures, you don't need that. So, uh, well, so just keep in mind that these numbers, they will pop up sometimes in the computation. Uh, so here, well, the, the, the main thing goes as follows, is that you construct some users uh, mu uh, nu to this equation. And you want to send nu to zero and find some invariant measure of mu. Right. So of course, when you want to uh, do some compactness arguments, you will need some uniform bounds. Uh, on the mu nu. And what are these uniform bounds? It's actually, so let me call the, this, the solution to this equation, I just call it mu nu. Uh, I just want some uh, estimates. Right here it would be like three. And, well, we have like we will have an inequality that does not depend on on, on you here, and of course, like well, this is this would just like uh, be a space estimate, but actually you can also like using the equation you will have like space time estimates, and you will be able to do a compactness argument, and so you will pass to the limit, you will find an invariant measure. So like, I think that you can all believe me that well, if you prove this kind of estimates for the measures mu nu, then we are we are done, basically. Like, then we, you need, just need to apply some, some compactness arguments. But so, yeah, I will show you that obtaining this, there is a threat that actually, like, the earlier equation will help us to get this threat uh, getting away. So, Oh well, and here, like the the u nu that you see here, is actually is a is, is a is a stationary process for the. Uh, I mean, its its law is following uh, the law of the invariant uh, uh, measure. So here, uh, well, so I, I want to show you, like, well, if you want to estimate this, it's exactly as the same thing as I did before. We're just going to use the equation. So here, at time t. This will be the same for all time t, because this is uh, like the measures invariance. Uh, but if I want to study this, I'm just going to uh, look at the equation satisfied, uh, satisfied by this. Right, so I just want to look at, well, of course, like this will uh, also be true if u nu is not an invariant uh, process, because otherwise I'm just writing like something, and you subtract the same thing. Uh, well, so I will do it in, you will see, like, I, I will not look at the, at the difference of this in uh, H3. I will try, like, I will try different sub left norms. I will do it in H1. You will see why I'm doing it in H1. Uh, this will be clear, but, so. Well, uh, well, so here, well, this will be the integral of the derivative of this. So, well, if you, if you look at the derivative of this H1 norm, so, well, you will have to take, like, so this will be uh, u nu times the derivative of u nu. And so you see, like, the terms that, uh, that appear is, like, you have 
you knew, and you take the scalar product with uh, minus b of u nu, u nu. Well, okay, so we have this term, and you also have, uh, well, the other term is minus nu, and you have Well, you have this one. Well, there is also the stochastic one. Well, uh, but, well, okay, so there is also the, the stochastic one. And because it's, uh, well, it's, it's, uh, it's a process here, well, actually the formula that you use here is the Ito formula. The Ito formula in the stochastic equation gives you like, yeah, do you have an extract contribution from here that would be just like of the square of this. So this will give you a contribution of like a, a new, because this is really the, 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 the square root here to the square. That'd be like one half of this. And you have like, uh, well, the contribution that you have is, will involve like, I think I always need to read the formula for this. But this is just, uh, this will just give you a, a number in the end. It's just, well, well, let's, yeah, I need to take, well, of course, here I need to take expectations. So I need to take expectations everywhere. And when I take expectation of this term, uh, because they are all the Brownian motions, this will disappear. So when you take expectation of this, this one disappear. And when you take expectation in the last term, this does not disappear. This gives you uh, just some, uh, some numbers. Something like this, right? So it's just a number. I would just give a name to this number, right? I will call it just phi one, because it's just like some H1 norm of uh, these coefficients. Well, so now you can just choose this coefficient so that this is just a finite number. So now I just want to show you that here there is a threat. Is that you see that, well, because we have an invariant, well, the, the measure is invariant, so this will be the same as this. So here we have a zero that equals this. So we can deduce something about some higher order Sobolev norms here. Because you see that this guy is just going, so if you integrate by part, it's just going to be, uh, uh, well, it's just going to be the H3 norm to the square, right? So the thing is that you apply E2 in H1 space and then you obtain some estimate of this. But if you look at the estimate that you obtain on this, well, this is like, there is a new, of course, in front of this. So the estimate that you will get from this will be, uh, here there is a new. So you just obtain something like with a number that does not depend on new, but here you have an estimate by some order one term divided by new. So the thing that you obtain finally is that, So I just want to show you that because this is very important is that, well, you have some phi one over two, but then you also have some, some scalar product, some expectation of, uh, right, over new. And of course, when new goes to zero, this is, uh, this is not good unless this is zero. And here, well, because we are in dimension two, the, pr the, the bilinear form, form B has two constellations. The first is in L2. Uh, it's the one that is true also in dimension three. And also consoles in H1. This is because of vorticity formulation. So actually here we use heavily the structure of the bilinear uh, term. That this is zero, so this is just a zero term. And then we have the uniform estimates. So that's, uh, well, here, like if you change it a little bit and something with not that good structure, then you lose something. Well, but you tell me, we did that in H1 and we had to rely on this constellation in H1. But if you want to rely on the constellation in L2, which is also valid in dimension three, you can also do it. And you obtain, if you do it in L2, 
Uh, that's the, oh, sorry, here that's, that's the H3 norm. If you do it in H1, uh, then you obtain some estimates on the H1 norm. You obtain some number that will just be the L2 coefficient, the, the L2 norm of the coefficients phi n. So I will write it like phi 0 over 2. So, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's H2. Yeah, right, sorry. Yeah. So um, you use the entropy to, to, to get one more. But if you just put a higher power of Laplacian, you would only need to use the energy, right? So like you could do it in 3D, for example. By yeah. Yeah, exactly. So here, this is a step you can do in 3D because, like, you take like alpha large and you can solve it. There's no problem constructing the global sol the, the solution for that, the invariant measure, and then uh, you uh, you do it, but you can only do it at the uh, L2 uh, L2 level. And if you take alpha large enough, then you have you have like some very large HS norm that I the square of it in expectation would just be a number. Okay, so here there's no threat for the three-dimensional case uh, at this point. And also recall that the Bourguin arguments also work when you don't already know the global solution. So for example, global regularity for earlier in dimension three, well, that, that's an open problem. But here, that's not the threat. The threat is actually that the last thing that we need to do now, and, but I think I won't do it, I just uh, say, say that, it's to, to the, so the, the major threat now is that we don't want this measure to be the direct mass at zero. So there is an argument that can exclude all the other atoms. Uh, it's also an argument of Cookson that I just uh, I did verbatim the same almost. So we can, even in dimension two and three, you can exclude any other atom than zero. And to exclude the direct mass at zero, this atom, you need to rely on the, these, two, uh, cons uh, these two conserved quantity. I can just show you that is that when you pass to the limits, the problem is uh, you don't have the equality anymore. You can pass to the limit only bounded functionals. Like bounded continuous functionals, they pass to the weak limit. But here, uh, it's not a bounded uh, functional. So you only get something like this. And of course, the threat is that this shrinks to zero. So how do you exclude that? It's actually, you exclude that by just uh, using the, these two inequalities. So uh, you just interpolate like H2 norm with H1 norm and H3 norm. Well, so you see that we are going to use things here and here. And because the goal now is to exclude the, uh, we only need to work with very low norm. We only need to explain, for example, that the H1 norm, well, an average, this is a positive constant. Of course, then it's not the direct mass at zero. And to do that, well, to do that, uh, uh, well, the thing is that, of course, at the U new level, this is conserved and this is just, uh, well, so first you need to explain that at the U new level, this constant does not depend on uh, nu. Well, so you can do that exactly by using this uh, interpolation here because you have precise control. And you need to tune a little bit the numbers that this works. And then uh, there is another thing is that, well, so now you will be able to pass to the limits this kind of thing, like the minimum between u in h1 squared and r squared. This, in expectation, well, if you put a new, you are able to pass to the limit here. And then you need another argument to explain that actually the reminder part, which is like uh, linked to the probability uh, that the H1 norm is larger than some number R, you need to explain that this is ridiculously small. And to prove that this is ridiculously small, you need something more, which is that actually the H1 norm, if you put it to the power of four, is expectation is bounded. And Actually, you have much more than power four. You can prove that it's uh, the expectation of the exponential of it is bounded. Actually, you just apply again the the um, the, 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 the Ito formula in L2 and in L2, so that you rely on the constellation uh, again. 
So that's, uh, yeah, to, to exclude the direct mass at zero, just keep in mind that you really need the two, co the, the two conserved quantities. Well, so that's all I wanted to say for, for today. Any other questions for Michael?